Hi, this is Troy Hunt, and I'd like to talk to you about five of the top security risks on the web today that you need to understand. If you're in any way responsible for information systems that touch the web, and these days that's just about all of them, then these are five really valuable risks for you to get a bit of an overview of. So let's jump in and see what I'm talking about. Very briefly about me, I am Troy Hunt. I do a lot of training on information security. You'll often find me at events speaking about security online and often writing and talking to organizations about how they can better secure their systems. You can find me on Twitter at Troy Hunt or via my webpage on TroyHunt.com. That's enough about me. Let's jump in and start looking at why we need to be talking about online security. Online attacks are big business. Recently, Verizon released their 2015 edition of the Data Breach Investigations Report, and they found that just over the period of the prior year, we were looking at somewhere in the order of $400 million of loss across 700 million compromised records, and they are just staggering volumes. Now, partly the size and impact of these breaches is reflective of just how much information we have online today, Part of it's due to how many more devices and applications we have collecting data every day. And of course, part of it again is reflective of the increasing sophistication of online attackers. And when you see numbers like this, you understand what a big business it is for those that are financially motivated to break into systems. Let's go and have a look at just some of the breaches we've seen over recent years, and I've found a great visualisation of it. This is a great way of looking at some of the world's biggest data breaches. It's courtesy of informationisbeautiful.net. And what we're seeing here is a bubble graph of different breaches that exposed in excess of 30,000 records. Now, as this data scrolls down, you'll see some very familiar names, perhaps some that you didn't even know had suffered from data breaches. And as it scrolls back through the years, you get a sense of just how many incidents of a really serious scale they've been. You also notice as we scroll back further, there are actually fewer bubbles, fewer incidents. And in fact, as we get back to around a decade ago, the density of the bubbles is significantly less than what we're seeing today in 2015. So data breaches are an increasingly prevalent problem and the security of our information systems is becoming more critical than ever. So that's just a brief introduction of why we really need to be focusing on security. Let's move on and I'll give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover throughout the remainder of this video. Admittedly, it's hard to pick just five security risks to talk about. So I decided to focus on the ones that are the most prevalent, the ones that have the highest impact and indeed, in some cases, the ones that are the easiest to exploit. So, for example, SQL injection. Now, by many measures, this remains the number one risk on the web today. It'd be hard to do a top five and not talk about SQL injection. So we're going to start off with that one. We'll then move on to insufficient transport layer security. So we're going to be talking about SSL, its successor, TLS, and its implementation across the web using HTTPS. And we'll look at a few different aspects of transport layer security when we get to that section of the video. We're also going to look at insecure password storage. We see so many breaches online today, so many cases of passwords which were kept private in systems then being leaked online. The way those passwords stored is absolutely paramount when it comes to protecting them in the event of a breach. So we're going to look at some bad practices and then talk about the way we need to be doing this. Cross-site scripting is another big one that's often up there in the top few risks on the web. Like SQL injection, this is a risk that has been around for a long time, yet it still remains very prevalent. So I'm going to show you just how that works and how an attacker can exploit it to steal information from victims. And finally, we'll also look at weak account management. And there are a number of different practices which constitute weak account management. We're going to talk about a few of those, and I'm going to give you a good walkthrough on one in particular that's been in the news a little bit lately. So they're the five risks that we're going to cover in this course.
And for each of these, I'm going to give you an overview of how the risk works. So we'll talk through a quick diagram of the mechanics. I'm going to give you an example of the risk in practice. So I will actually be doing demonstrations here as well. And then we're going to talk about some defenses. Usually not just one defense, but multiple ways that we can strengthen systems against these risks. So this is all going to be very practical, very easily consumable information, and very valuable for anyone responsible for protecting information systems. So let's jump into it, and we'll start by looking at SQL injection. By many measures, SQL injection is the number one risk on the web today. It's very easy to discover the risk, it's very easy to exploit it, and I'm gonna show you just how easy in just a moment. And the impact of an exploit is significant. We are talking about exfiltrating data from a system, modifying data in the system, and possibly even pivoting through into internal networks and doing a lot of damage even beyond the firewall. So it's an extremely serious risk, and it's a good place for us to start. Let's jump in, and I'll start by giving you a walkthrough of the mechanics of a SQL injection attack. Let's talk about how this attack actually works. Now imagine we've got an attacker who's going to be communicating with a web server which sits in front of a database. Now the attacker is talking to the web server simply by making web requests. They could be over HTTP or over HTTPS. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that the attacker is able to send requests to that web server. Now very often, when a web server receives a request, it prepares a query and sends it off to the database. And that query is often constructed from data that the user provides to the web server. Now under normal operating circumstances, that data is entirely innocuous. The user might be asking for a certain record, for example. In a SQL injection attack, the attacker is going to malform that request in order to change the execution path of the query. So they're actually going to get the query to do something that it was never intended to do. Now when that query runs, the database responds back to the web server with a result. Now usually, the result would be a record set. Certainly that's one of the more common outcomes of running a query against a database. But the result could also be an internal exception on the database. So what will often happen in a SQL injection attack is the attacker is trying to cause an error in the database such that the error is then returned to the web server and then eventually to the attacker. Now this is a particular style of SQL injection attack that we call error-based SQL injection. So one which is dependent on the attacker causing these errors and then seeing the errors from the database in the website. This all becomes much easier to visualize when you actually see it in action. So let's jump over to the browser and I'll show you exactly how an error-based SQL injection attack works. This is a sample application I've built for this video and it's all about snowboards, getting ready for the coming winter season. It's on a fictitious domain, snowboards.com and this app has got a number of different security risks in it and in fact they're the very risks that we're going to be exploiting in order for me to demonstrate how they actually work. Now we're going to start out by looking at the risk of SQL injection. And here's how I'd like to demonstrate this. We'll notice on the front page we have three different brand logos down towards the bottom. Now I can choose one of these and drill down into it. I'm going to take a look at the Burton boards, so we'll choose Burton. And here we see four different boards. Inevitably, if I choose one of the other brands from the previous page, I would see different boards. This is very typical web behavior. And the way it's implemented is by passing the brand ID in the URL. So you can see up there in the address bar, brand ID equals one. And inevitably one is Burton. Now what often happens in an online system like this is that brand ID from the query string would go into a query against the database and a result set would return with all the Burton boards. So that piece of data often ends up in a SQL query. Now what an attacker wants to do in a SQL injection attack is start to modify this data such that the query does different things. Things that it was never designed to do. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to jump up to the address bar 
And what I'd like to do here is just change that one. And I'm going to change it to a 1x. Now what's significant about doing this is that it's now no longer going to be a number. Let's see what happens when we load this URL. So this is where the SQL injection attack begins. We've got ourselves an internal exception here that's bubbling up and appearing in the web application. Now we can see a title here, incorrect syntax near X. And just beneath that, we can see some exception details that explain that it is a SQL exception. Now this means it is actually an exception in the database, which is bubbled up. So it's been returned from the database to the web app and eventually appeared in the browser. In an error-based SQL injection attack, the attacker wants to exploit this error reporting. Let me show you what I mean by that. If we were to replace the value of this brand ID and start changing it to other values, so for example, we might change this to a subquery and we'll make it something like select star from users. Now when we run this, we get a different error. Invalid object name users. This is actually the database saying that there is no table called users. And because the web application is improperly configured, which is a very common scenario, and it's returning those internal exceptions, we can actually see that database message. Now, if we keep tweaking this query string value, we can start to get the database to disclose even more information. So for example, let's change users to customer we get a different type of exception now. And in fact, what this exception is telling us is that this particular subquery, and this is what it is because there's another query wrapped around this that's looking for a value returned from what we're just passing here in the URL. But this particular one here is returning multiple results. And that's not something that the query in this application can handle. Now that doesn't matter so much because the important thing is, is that we've been able to cause an error such that the database has told us what's going on inside it. Let's try probing away a little bit more. I'm going to change the select star in the URL here to select top one password. Now you may also notice every time I enter a space after I load the page, it replaces it with a percentage 20. That's just URL encoding that the browser automatically adds. It still means that the web server sees a space sent in the request. Let's try this one. And now we actually see a really interesting error. And in fact, the error we see here has a password in it. It's this one right here encapsulated in quotes, password with a zero. And this is a legitimate password from the customer table in the database. And the reason that we're seeing it in the error message here is because the query has actually tried to check for a brand ID that is equal to the word password with a zero. Now that brand ID in the database is normally a number. And when the database is asked to compare it to a string, an exception has occurred and been returned in the response. And that's what we see right here. So we've actually managed to find a password in the database simply by changing the URL in the web app. Now attackers use this mechanism to exfiltrate huge amounts of data out of systems. It might look a little bit laborious doing it like this, but it can actually be highly automated. In fact, I want to show you just how much we can automate this attack. And to do that, I'm going to go and grab a little piece of software that's going to make this very, very easy. What we're looking at here is a tool called Havage. It's freely available on the internet and it makes SQL injection an absolute breeze. Here's how it works. I'm going to select everything that's currently in that target field, and I'm going to paste in the URL that we were just on, the legitimate URL, the one that showed the Burton snowboards. I'm now going to jump up and hit Analyze just next to that target. And down the bottom, we see that it goes away and makes a few requests to the website. Now what we can do after that initial analysis is start asking Havage to get us more data out of the database. In fact, what I'd like it to do is go and have a look at the tables in the database. So I've hit the tables button. I'm now going to say get tables. And here we go. There are four 
tables in the database. Now I'm really interested in this customer table because it sounds like the sort of information that an attacker would like. So I've checked that. Let's now go and get the columns of that table. And here are our columns. This is pretty useful information. Now I, as an attacker, would like to get the email address, the name, and the password out of that database. Those three fields will do. Let's now go and get the data. And here we go. It is just flying through those records. And Havage is doing exactly what we just did in the browser. It's issuing requests to the website, which are formed specifically to get the database to throw an exception and then return that exception to the website and the website being misconfigured and showing those internal exceptions actually leaks the internal data of the system. This will just keep going and going and going until it gets all the data out of the system. And this is how easy SQL injection can be. Find a potentially vulnerable URL, so typically one with a query string, copy it, paste it into an automated tool, and that is often all that is required. So that's how easy SQL injection can be. Let's now go and talk about how to defend against the risk. There are a few really fundamental practices that are used to defend against the risk of a SQL injection attack. And the first one is simply validating untrusted data. So what I mean by untrusted data is anything that comes from an external party. So when we change the URL, that came from us as an external party. And the question that the application has to ask is, is this valid data? So in the case just then, the application should have been expecting a brand ID, which was a number. It should not have been accepting something that wasn't a number. That was never going to be valid data, but the app allowed it anyway. So that was the first point of failure. The next one, and this is really the heart of defending against SQL injection risks, is parameterizing queries. Now what this means is writing the query using parameters that keep the query itself and the untrusted data entirely separate. No matter what data you actually pass to the database in the query, it never changes the execution of the way the query was originally designed. So this one here is absolutely critical. Another one that's frequently overlooked is locking down the database. So let's say an attacker does manage to find a SQL injection risk in the application. Because the attack is predicated on the app talking to the database, the scope of damage that the attacker can do is entirely limited to what the account the web application is using can actually do in the database. So for example, should the web application actually be able to read every single column of every single table? Usually not. Or let's take it a step further. Should the application be able to run commands that are normally reserved for system administrators on the database? Almost certainly not. And this talks to just how far an attacker can go with SQL injection. At the absolute upper end of the scale of impact, an attacker can run system commands on the database. Now once they can do that, they can start pivoting through the internal network as well. So this is not just about an externally facing risk. And certainly there are many documented examples of the attacker being able to run arbitrary commands on the database server that give them access to a whole raft of internal machines well and truly firewalled off from the publicly facing domain. And this is often the case with SQL injection as well. The database server sits behind a firewall, only the web application is allowed to talk to it, but if the web application is issuing malicious commands, even though that database may be sitting there within a private network, the attacker now has control of it. Now, in addition to these three things, there is the whole defense in depth approach. So applying layer upon layer of security defense, something like a web application firewall, for example, is an additional defense that would block many SQL injection attacks. Even good cryptographic storage of the content stored in the database would put a big dent in the impact of an attack if an attacker got the data out and couldn't actually use it. Defense in depth is a concept that we're going to keep coming back to throughout the remainder of this video
because it really is a fundamentally important practice. Don't just leave one point of failure. This is about putting multiple locks in place so that even if an attacker manages to break through one, maybe even two different layers, there's still another wall of defense. So that's SQL injection. Next up, we're going to take a look at insufficient transport layer security. When we talk about insufficient transport layer security, we're really talking about a lack of encryption on the network layer. So particularly when we talk about communicating over the web, we're talking about missing HTTPS, or rather applications talking over the insecure HTTP scheme. It's not just that, there are also questions of, is it good HTTPS or possibly weak HTTPS? We'll touch on all that as we go through this next section. So let's jump in and have a look at how this risk can manifest itself. Let's take a look at how risks on the transport layer come about. Imagine we have a victim, and the victim is talking backwards and forwards with the web server. Now keep in mind that when this traffic goes over the web, there are a lot of different points in the network. So we often have someone, say, on a wireless device, talking over the air to a wireless router somewhere, possibly going over an internal network somewhere before it hits an ADSL modem, goes out over the telco's lines, eventually hits an ISP, and then goes through the internet backbone and finally makes its way to the web server. There are a lot of different independent components that any traffic goes across. Now, when we talk about attacks on the transport layer, we're talking about a man in the middle, or in other words, an attacker who can jump on the wire somewhere and get between the victim and that target web server. Now, there are multiple places where this could happen. So one example is a rogue Wi-Fi network. The victim goes along to a cafe somewhere, connects to the network, and doesn't realize that the owner of the wireless access point is actually watching all their traffic. Conversely, it may be that the owner of the network is actually a victim themselves and their router has been compromised by an attacker. There are many examples of routers suffering from attacks which change the DNS settings of them. And when that happens and someone makes a request through that router, very often the requests are not resolved to the system they think they're talking to, and instead the requests get routed to an attacker's system. If we go further up the network stack, we can even get to the point of ISP monitoring. There are some really prominent examples of the actual internet service provider watching and in some cases even modifying the traffic when it's going across an insecure transport layer. And that's another point worth making here as well. The risk here is not just about an attacker reading the traffic. When there's a lack of encryption, the attacker can also modify it. And that's the example I'd like to give you right now. So let's jump over to the sample web app and I'll give you an example of a real world attack that did actually modify an application in order for an attacker to siphon off credentials. Our sample snowboard app here has a login facility. And what you might notice when we look at this login page is that the address has no HTTPS. So this page has not been loaded securely. But there's an interesting twist to this. If we go and right click on one of these fields, and we go down and inspect element, we can have a look at how the form is structured. And one of the things we'll find up here is if we scroll up to the form action, we can see that it's actually going to post to HTTPS. So when you submit this form, the username and password will be encrypted and sent securely. Now many people believe this is sufficient and they have that belief simply because the credentials are encrypted once you submit the form. Now what they neglect is that because this login page was not loaded securely, you can't trust the integrity of it. It could have been modified by an attacker. And in fact, if we scroll down a little bit on this page, I have mounted a man in the middle attack. And what I've actually done is dropped in a keylogger. Now the way a keylogger like this works is it's just JavaScript, and every single time I type a character in any of the fields on the page, that character is going to be sent off to hacker.com. 
Now, this might look like a very hypothetical risk, but precisely this attack has been mounted in the past against the likes of Facebook. Facebook no longer load any login pages in an insecure way, but there was a time only a few years ago where this is the way it worked, and there are documented examples at the ISP level where key loggers were injected into Facebook's login page. So let me show you how this one works. What I want to do is jump over to my network tab because this is going to show us every single request the browser makes. Now I'm going to scroll down a little bit so we can see our login form and then watch this as we start typing. I'm going to type in an email address and see as we did that a whole bunch of requests just appeared. If I scroll down a little bit we can see every character that was just typed in. John at gmail.com and then I'm going to go back to the password field and I'm going to give John a password. Now even though we're seeing an obfuscated password field every single time that key was pressed that particular key was sent off to hacker.com. We haven't even logged in yet we've not even pressed the button but every single step along the way John was already compromised. Now keep in mind that any of those points along the network communication that we looked at just before could inject this password keylogger. It's just JavaScript. It's a couple of lines in the HTML source of the web page. So the lesson here is that whilst HTTPS is important, it's about a lot more than just using it piecemeal across the application. You've got to think about not just every place where information needs to remain confidential, but also where integrity is important. What would be the impact if anything that was loaded insecurely was actually changed? Now that we've seen this pretty brief yet very real world demo, let's move on and have a look at how we can defend against attacks on the transport layer. When we talk about defending against the sorts of risk that we just saw, clearly the number one objective is to apply transport layer security. We want to see TLS applied everywhere possible. And keep in mind that strictly speaking, TLS is the successor to SSL. You will still see the term SSL used quite extensively because it has become such a strong part of the vernacular now. Where we're at today though, is that we're really getting to the point where TLS should just be on by default. We're moving towards HTTPS everywhere. A secure web as the norm. And in fact, there's increasing pressure for people to move in that direction. Even Google talking about the presence of a secure address as a ranking signal for search engine optimization. They'll actually make you more discoverable if you're using HTTPS. Now, it's not just about using TLS. You need to use good TLS. And in recent times, we've seen many attacks against weak TLS. So for example, we saw things like the Poodle attack in 2014. It's not just that, we saw numerous other exploits against old implementations of cryptography on the transport layer. So by all means, encrypt everything, apply TLS very liberally, but apply the right TLS. It's also more than just the network layer. It's very much about getting the applications to actually use transport layer security properly. So what we just saw was a great example. When that login page was loaded insecurely, that was the app design that did that. When developers are building these apps, they need to be conscious of the risks posed by insecure communications. So the login form was one example. Another common one that's gotten wrong is things like authentication cookies. Are they ever passed around without encryption? That's enough for an attacker to steal someone's session, which can have dire consequences. So getting developers educated and getting them on board with the value proposition of transport layer security is also really critical. And finally, the risk posed by a man in the middle is not just constrained to the external environment. Very often, communications between systems within internal networks are left wide open, no security at all. And it happens because there is this assumption, a false assumption, that traffic behind the firewall is already secure. The bad guys are on the outside, the good guys are on the inside. And you often hear people talking about this paradox of corporate security, which is the hard shell and the soft center. 
Attacks do happen behind the firewall. Transport layer security internally is also absolutely essential and you want to apply that just as liberally as what you do in the external environment as well. So that's attacks on the transport layer. Do remember integrity as well as confidentiality and apply TLS very liberally both externally and internally. Now that we've covered that, let's move on and start talking about the way passwords are stored. Insecure password storage is a topic which very often comes up and we have very good insight into how it's done inside many organisations by virtue of the fact that many data breaches are made public. Attackers do frequently dump their spoils on the public web and that gives us an opportunity to see how organisations are protecting their customers because after all, Secure password storage all comes down to how are those credentials going to be protected in the event that they do actually get leaked. Let's move on and run through an overview of how this risk manifests itself. Let's take a scenario where we have a database that contains the passwords and of course we have an attacker. Now the attacker obtains the passwords. I don't want to trivialise this because it can be a very sophisticated attack. But as we just saw with SQL injection, it can also be a very trivial attack, particularly when attackers use automated tools. And we do see many systems compromised and credentials leaked using tools like Havage. So that's actually a pretty good representation of how attackers can get these credentials from storage. Now, when we talk about the protection of passwords in storage, we're really talking about what defense do those credentials have in the case that an attacker does actually manage to exfiltrate them from the database. So this is already assuming that some serious security incident has occurred. And now it's about risk mitigation, damage control. How can we limit the attacker's ability to actually do anything useful with those passwords? Because getting them out is one thing, but if they can't then go and use them somewhere else, then the passwords themselves are rendered useless. Now typically what an attacker wants to do is crack passwords. Now cracking has a very distinct meaning. Normally when passwords are stored in databases, there's one of three approaches. Number one is that they are stored in plain text. No cryptographic process whatsoever. If an attacker gets those out, there is no cracking to do. They already have the raw password. The second mechanism is using encryption. Now, of course, when we talk about encryption, we're talking about an algorithm that uses a key. At some point, there is decryption. And the risk here is that if an attacker does compromise a system and they also get the key, then they simply unlock the passwords. All of them, all in one go. So you effectively have these absolute states where either everything is encrypted and it's safe or everything is unlocked and it's all exposed. Now the third mechanism is using a cryptographic hash. It's not encryption, it is a one-way process. And when an attacker tries to crack these, what they're actually trying to do is guess what the password is. If they can make enough guesses fast enough, they can get plain text passwords out of the system. Now I want to give you an example of what this looks like. So I've actually prepared a whole bunch of passwords. I've stored them using a very typical approach that many people have used in their systems. And now I want to show you how easy it is for an attacker to crack them. I went and generated tens of thousands of accounts in our sample vulnerable online system. And the thing about this system is that it stored the passwords as a salted SHA-1 hash. Now many people believe that salting and hashing is the right way of storing credentials. And they're partly right, but it can be done weekly. And I want to give you an example of what weekly can actually mean in terms of an attacker then cracking them. In front of us here on the screen is Hashcat. And Hashcat is an extremely powerful hash cracking tool. I'm going to start this command running. And what Hashcat is doing is it's going through and looking at my salted SHA-1 hashes. So what we're actually seeing on the screen at the moment is a delimited list of salts in one column, the hashes 
of the salted passwords in another column, and in the far right column, we are now seeing the plain text versions of those passwords. So the system is actually going through and cracking these. Now the reason Hashcat can do this is that it runs extremely quickly in the GPU of my machine. GPUs are very good at calculating hashes. In fact, they're so good that they can calculate many billions of hashes per second when they're running at absolute optimal speed. And we're talking about consumer level hardware here as well. So literally GPUs that you can go down to your local store and buy for a few hundred dollars. Now this is running through extremely quickly. And I want to give you an idea of just how quickly it's running. So I'm going to quit this process and we'll now see a number of stats appear on the screen. Let me talk here about just the most important ones. I ran this for 1 minute and 46 seconds. In order to let this particular cracking process finish, it would have needed about another 39 minutes. Now during this time, what it was actually doing was going through a password dictionary that I gave Hashcat. And it's one called hashkiller.com.dic. And this password dictionary had somewhere in the order of 20 million possible passwords in it. So examples of passwords from previously compromised systems. And what Hashcat was doing was going through that password dictionary and hashing those passwords using the salts from this input file, saltedhashes.txt, and then comparing them to the ones that were stored. Now if it matched, then it meant that Hashcat knew what the plain text password was. Now this was all possible because here's the rate at which it was creating hashes. 787 mega hashes per second. So that's 787 million hashes every second. That is an astoundingly fast rate. And here's the thing with password cracking. It all comes down to speed. The faster the attacker can compute hashes, the faster they can crack a leak of exposed password hashes. When we talk about the cryptographic storage of passwords, this is not about aiming for a 0% success rate on behalf of the attacker. This is about trying to reduce their success rate as much as possible within a given period of time. So effectively make it too hard for them to do much at all of use with those leaked passwords. Now this is a really important observation because security is very often about compromises. Password hashes aren't about being 100% secure. They are about being as secure as is practically feasible given the circumstances in which the system runs. With that said, let's go and take a look at some of the things we can do to better strengthen password storage. Let's run through a bunch of good password storage practices. And the first one is always hash. So I just talked about those three storage mechanisms. Clearly plain text is never acceptable. Encryption is also not a good choice because of the risk of a compromised system actually leaking the encryption key. You need to assume that everything is in the attacker's control. And what that means is using a good hashing algorithm. So this brings me to the next point, choosing the right one. There are some excellent hashing algorithms that have a definable workload. So that is, you can choose how slow they are. So hashing algorithms like Bcrypt, for example, where you can set a workload to increase the amount of time it takes to run, such that you can find what the sweet spot is for performance running in your environment versus security should those password hashes actually be leaked. These are referred to as adaptive password hashing algorithms. They're specifically designed for protecting passwords and you can control how long they take to run. Now there's something else that we can do to really reduce the attacker's success rate if they do get a hold of hashed passwords. And that's actually enforcing some good password rules. Now this has benefits well beyond just hashing alone as well. It protects from things like brute force attacks against the login feature of the web application. Clearly, stronger passwords are better. We want our users to try and use passwords that are unique, that are long, that are random. And of course, there are usability barriers to doing that, 
but from a technical perspective, it's absolutely the right thing to do. The challenge now is trying to find that balance. So we're back to talking about how we should balance security with some other aspect of the system. In this case, usability. That's a discussion that has to be had in the context of the system and who the users are, but it is definitely a conversation that should be had. Now, slightly analogous to this point is encouraging strong passwords. One practice we sometimes see on the web, which is extremely detrimental to strong passwords, is rules that stop people from, say, creating a long password. So, for example, it can't exceed 10 characters. Or creating a random password. A site may say that you're not allowed to have particular characters in the password. Those really are anti-patterns for good password storage. So it's very important to let people go as strong as they want. Let them make it 100 characters if they really want to. Let them use whatever characters they like within there. Particularly as people start to gravitate towards password managers, this becomes really, really important. So that's passwords in storage. Get the right hashing algorithm, encourage strong passwords, and the impact decreases dramatically. One final point on passwords as well. Keep in mind that, rightly or wrongly, people do tend to reuse passwords. That one system that didn't secure them strong enough, if it is breached, and if those passwords are resolved back to plain text, inevitably there will be a significant portion of users that used those passwords in other systems, perhaps even on critical business systems within your network. That could be systems that are out of direct reach of attackers, it could be systems that do a very good job of storing their passwords. But when an attacker has valid credentials for a user, no matter how well put together that system is, they have a significant advantage in now exploiting that system. So keep in mind how the scope of this risk goes beyond just the immediate system. Next up, let's move on and take a look at cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting remains one of the most significant risks on the web today. It's often rated up there in the top few risks on the web. And it's also a risk that we've known about for a long time. Even a decade ago, there were serious attacks against systems at risk of XSS. So let's go and take a look at how this risk actually works. Why is it so serious? What can we do to defend against it? Let's jump into that now. Let's begin by looking at a victim, an attacker, and the web server. Now, there are several types of XSS attack. And one of the most common ones is what's referred to as a reflected XSS attack. And in a reflected XSS attack, the attacker gives the victim a link to the vulnerable system that has an XSS payload in it. And when I say payload, I'm just talking about part of the URL, normally a query string. That's all it is. So this is the way the attack starts. Now, how does the attacker do this? So how does he get the link to the victim? Well, think about the ways that you could distribute a URL. It could be distributed via an email campaign. We all get plenty of spam mail. That could have this XSS link in it. Social media is very popular. It's exceptionally easy to share links via a resource like Twitter or Facebook. There are many different ways of getting this link to the victim. The main thing is, though, that once the victim receives this link, they follow it to the target site. So it goes to that web server, and inevitably the web server responds with a page which is rendered in the browser. Now, the real key to XSS is that when that page renders, it's reflecting the attacker's XSS payload. And when we go and do the demo in a moment, you'll see exactly what I mean by reflecting. But effectively, it just means that information that was in that link that the attacker sent is now going to appear in the web page. Now, in order for this attack to be successful, when the page actually renders in the browser, it sends some of the victim's data back to the attacker. Now, this is actually a fundamentally simple attack, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a moment. The main thing to understand now, though, is that the impact of an attack like this can be severe. It can mean an attacker entirely taking over the victim's account and then being able to impersonate them and perform any activities that the victim normally could when they were logged on to the target website. 
Let's jump into the demo and I'll show you how that works. So here we are back on the vulnerable website. And there are a couple of things I want to point out here. So number one, in the top right hand corner, you can see it says you are logged in as Troy Hunt. I am presently authenticated to this website. And XSS attacks frequently take advantage of that fact. In fact, the attack we're going to use now is the atypical attack that shows just how much damage an XSS attack can do. And it is predicated on the user being logged in. The other thing you'll see is that now on the front page, we can search for the hottest brands. So we have a text box here. And what I'd like to do is search for a snowboard brand. And I'm going to search for Libtech. Let's now run that search. Now, as it turns out, no results were found. But here's the important thing that I want to show you. You'll see in the middle of the page, it says you searched for Libtech. So it's actually reflected the information that I provided to the site. So this is the reflected component of XSS. You give the system some information, it then shows that back to you in the web page. Now you'll also notice that Libtech is up there in the URL. The plus sign between Lib and Tech is just URL encoding. When the server receives this link, it still recognizes that as a space. What I'd like to do now is make a little modification of my search so that I can show you where things start to go wrong in terms of an XSS attack. So I'm just going to go back to the home page and I'm going to change this search query. So what I've just done is I've put an EM tag around the word tech. How the web application now responds to this search is absolutely critical. Will we see what we've typed here actually appear on the screen or will we see something different? Let's run that search. So notice what we see here. We don't see that EM tag. Instead, we see you searched for lib and then the word tech is in italics. So why is this happening? Well, the EM tag causes text to appear in italics when that EM tag is rendered into the HTML source of the page. And in fact, we can go up here and just right click on that text, inspect the element, and then we'll see in the code off here to the left of the screen, exactly what we search for has actually appeared in the source of the page. So we've actually got the EM tag wrapped around the word tech. Now, here's the significance of this. We have just changed the behavior of the page. Okay, it's minor, it's just one word in italics, but we have changed the way it's actually functioning. What an attacker now begins to think about is how could they possibly change this search term so that it rendered something else to the page? Something that actually had a function that could exploit the fact that this victim is presently logged in. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to jump over here and close my developer tools. And now I'm going to go and paste in a URL that a hypothetical attacker has sent me. So remember from the previous diagram, a reflected XSS attack is predicated on the attacker getting the victim to follow a very carefully formed URL with an attack payload in it. So let's see how that works. I'm going to go up to the address bar. I'm going to paste in my URL, the one that our hypothetical attacker has sent me, and I'm going to load the page. Now, not much actually happens, at least not visibly. In fact, what we see here is you searched for, and then nothing after that. But something did actually happen, something very malicious. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to press F12, which gives me the developer tools in my browser. What this allows us to do is I can now go down to the network tab and every single request that this page makes will now be visible here. So I'm going to go back to the address bar. I'm going to press enter to reload the page. And here are all the requests. Now I'm going to scroll up just a little bit because we're going to see something of interest. And it's this request just here. Let's have a look at this request URL we can see this one goes off to attacker.com and then it's got a query string, cookies equals. And after that we see auth token equals 
and then we see a great big long string. Now what's actually happened here is this cross-site scripting attack has taken the cookies from my browser and sent them off to the attacker's website. Now, why is this cookie significant? In a web application, the way the application keeps the user authenticated between each subsequent request they make is via an auth token. And an auth token is just a little cookie that sits on the browser. It's a cryptographically strong cookie, so it can't simply be tampered with. But that cookie has to go back to the web server on every single authenticated request. And an XSS attack can potentially access that cookie. In fact, if I close the developer tools here and I inspect where we would normally see the search term and we have a look inside the H2 heading tag, which is where it appears, we can see it says use search for script and there's a bit of script in here. Now this is what was passed as the payload in that XSS attack. And in fact, what the script does is it writes an image onto the page and it sets the source of the image as the attacker's website and it requests that website with the cookies stored in the browser. This is actually a very simple attack. It's just one URL and this is really the crux of reflected cross-site scripting. If an attacker can find a way to pass content in the URL that when the victim clicks on it then appears in the web page of the target site, they can do serious damage. This will let them take over the account of the victim. They can take that cookie that we just saw, create it in their own browser, and now they are logged in as the victim. So that's the mechanics of the way a cross-site scripting attack works. Let's now move on and have a look at how to defend against this risk. As with each of the other risks that we've looked at already, defending against cross-site scripting is a multifaceted affair. There are a number of different defenses we can put in place. And the first one is the same as what we saw just before with SQL injection, validating the untrusted data. So we need to ask the question, is this data that is being passed to the system allowable? In the case we just saw, it was a search term that had the cross-site scripting payload. The developers of the system would want to be asking, is that really a valid search term? Could we have a rule which was a bit more explicit about what we knew to be a good search term? So what sort of patterns would it adhere to? And then if a potentially malicious search was done, could it just be rejected rather than actually processing it? The next point is really the heart of defending against cross-site scripting, and it's output encoding. Now what we mean here is that when user input is sent to the system and it needs to be reflected back in the browser and reflecting something like a search term is a perfectly legitimate requirement. It's really important that that data is output encoded. And what that means is that a number of the characters are going to be encoded such that something like a piece of script doesn't actually run in the browser it will appear on the screen. So what we should have seen is just that entire JavaScript block in the you searched for text. Of course, there wouldn't be any snowboards that match that search term, but that doesn't matter. The point is, is that the cross-site scripting attack wouldn't have run because the script tag wouldn't have been rendered into the source code exactly as it was provided to the system. Now, when we talk about output encoding, the context is also really important. If somebody wants to encode content for HTML, that is different to the way they encode it for an attribute of an HTML tag. That's different to the way they'd encode it if they wanted to put it in the CSS context. And that's different again to how they would encode it if they wanted to put it in a JavaScript context. So getting the context right for the encoding is actually really important because if it's not right, not only will the system not behave in the way that it's intended to, but it could very well still leave a risk. And finally, protecting cookies. Attacks like this work because they get access to the cookies in the browser. Now there's a very simple way of protecting cookies from script like we just saw, and that's to flag the cookie as HTTP only, which means that the server can read the cookie but any JavaScript running on the client can't. So that's a really fundamental control. 
Now, one other thing worth mentioning with cross-site attacks as well, and by that I mean not just cross-site scripting, but an attack like cross-site request forgery as well, is that there are many documented examples of where they can actually impact the internal network as well. So a victim loads up a website which has one of these attacks and they get script which talks to internal services. It could make requests to other websites behind the firewall. Because after all, the website is actually running in the victim's browser which sits inside a private network. So this scope goes much further than just the externally facing web application as well. It can be much more serious than that. And it just goes to show how important it is to lock down this risk so that not only do you not put this particular website at risk, but you don't potentially put the broader internal ecosystem at risk as well. So that's cross-site scripting. The last risk we're going to go and take a look at now is weak account management. When I talk about weak account management, it's not just one thing. There are multiple different ways of standing up account management facilities that demonstrate various weaknesses. Now often these are just little nuances that aren't really considered to be a security risk when they're designed. But when you look at them in the right light, you realize that they can indeed be used in very malicious ways. So let's go and take a look at some of those ways now. This time, I want to start by looking at different ways that you can have weak account management. So one really obvious way is poor password rules. If you allow people to create very short passwords, let's say that may just be all numbers, that's going to create a whole bunch of different problems because people will often adhere to the absolute minimum criteria. Now, one of those problems is brute force attacks, which also brings into question how is an application defending against brute force attacks? So for example, what if an attacker has a script that keeps trying to log into someone's account with different passwords? Perhaps it tries the 100 most common passwords that people use. How will the app behave? Will it allow the attacker to just keep trying over and over and over again? Another aspect of account management which is often weak is the remember me feature. So that little checkbox you see when you log in, which allows you to stay logged into the website for long periods of time. I've seen many cases where this feature has done things like stored the actual username and password in a cookie in the user's browser. Now that's a really risky way of storing sensitive information. And certainly there are much more secure ways of building this feature. Another example is a vulnerable password change feature. So for example, a page that allows you to change the password to something new, but never have to provide the existing password. That not only puts the user at risk of someone else possibly sitting down at their PC and changing their password, but it also puts them at risk of attacks like cross-site request forgery, where an attacker could trick the user's browser into changing the password on their behalf changing it to one that the attacker has already predetermined. Not having to provide the existing password before doing that introduces this problem. And while we're talking about passwords, having an enumerable password reset function. Now this has actually been a topical issue in recent times, and I'm gonna give you a real world example of that in a moment. But let's begin by talking through the mechanics of how an enumerable password reset function actually works. This is going to be a very simple diagram and it should make sense immediately when you see how it works. So let's imagine we have an attacker and of course we have our web server, we have an application running on it and the attacker asks the web server if an account exists on it. So does a user have an account on that system? And then the web server tells them Yes or no? It is that simple. And the question to ask is whether or not this should be possible. So should an attacker be able to easily discover whether someone's email address exists on that system? Here's the topical example I mentioned. During 2015, we had two really serious attacks against sites that had some pretty sensitive data in them. One was the Adult Friend Finder site, the other was Ashley Madison. 
both sites designed to help people have affairs. Their privacy on those sites is clearly absolutely paramount to them. They would not want other people discovering they had accounts. Yet in both cases, both those sites, before they were hacked and data was exposed, had an account enumeration risk. And what that meant was that anybody, attackers, jealous spouses, the general public, could go to one of those sites and simply ask it if a person had an account. Let's jump over to our vulnerable app and I'll show you exactly how that works. Here's a fairly typical looking password reset page. Enter an email address and then simply reset. Let's have a look at how this works and this will probably be a very familiar pattern to you. I'm going to enter an email address and then submit the form. And here we see a message, password reset emailed. Okay, that's a fairly typical outcome. Let's now go back and try a different email address. So this time, here's what I'm going to do. Let's try and reset Mary's password. Now we get a very different message. And again, this is probably a familiar pattern to you. It's not that unusual at all. But have a think about what's just happened. The system has told us that John has an account. It's then told us that Mary does not have an account. Now for John, it was implicit. Mary, it's pretty clear. She obviously has no account on that system. So the mechanics of this are actually very simple. And it's something that just about anybody can do on just about any system. It does, however, beg the question of how much of a risk is this? So for example, on a snowboard site like this, would John really be upset that anybody can go and discover that he has an account? Possibly not. But imagine that John had an account on a website that was much more sensitive. Let's imagine it was Adult Friend Finder or Ashley Madison. Would John then be upset that both those sites were disclosing his presence? Well, quite possibly yes. He probably would have expected to have privacy on those sites. So this is another common theme within security applying the right controls to the right places. Now, many people will argue that you should have privacy on every site, even if it is just a snowboard site. It shouldn't disclose the presence of the account. But certainly there are different degrees of impact. And you could quite reasonably argue that a site like this is much less likely to adversely impact customers if this risk exists than some other classes of website. So let's go and talk about how to defend against this risk. There are a few different things we can do to mitigate this risk of account enumeration. And the first one is to simply always respond in an identical fashion. So in that web app, we would need to see the same response. And a good response is something like, an email has been sent to you. Now, of course, if someone has an email on the system, then the email that they receive can simply begin the password reset process. If they don't have an account, then the email can explain that. Hey, you just did a password reset, but you don't actually have an account on this site. Perhaps you created it under a different email address. Or if you didn't have an account at all, you might like to register. That mechanism uses email as the verification channel of the account's existence. And of course, the recipient of the email has every right to know whether they have an account on the system, but it keeps it away from the public so that someone who's got absolutely nothing to do with that account can't simply go through and enumerate them. Now, password reset is only one vector. So consider other vectors as well. And of course, when I talk about vector, I'm talking about the way that this risk can be exploited. So something like the login. Some systems will explicitly say, hey, that username that you tried to log in with doesn't exist. Clearly, a better response would be to say that the username and password combination is incorrect. Registration is another common risk because a registration system likes to make sure that there's nobody already in the system with the same email address. Of course, the solution to handling registration is the same as the solution for handling password resets. You have to give the same response in the web application and then take the direct communication with the individual off the website and into email. 
And finally, and I did touch on this several times, this is really a contextual risk. The snowboard example is a very different risk profile to the adult website example. And there are a whole bunch of shades of gray in between. For example, a bank. Should you be able to discover if an individual has an account on a particular banking website? Well, it's financial data that can be quite sensitive. That can be the sort of information which is then used in a phishing attack. Think about the impact on an organization as well. So how might a risk like this actually extend beyond just the website itself and begin impacting the corporate environment? Well, a really good example would be for an attacker to use the information that they can discover via enumeration risks in a spear phishing attack. So what if the attacker went around to a number of common websites, checked if the person had an account on them, and then sent them a very specifically targeted email that represented the fact the attacker knows they have an account on that site. Spear phishing attacks are often very successful because they're so well crafted. They contain information about the individual. So that's a number of different weak account management practices we've now looked at. And we've especially spent time looking at this account enumeration risk. That wraps up the five main risks I wanted to look at in this video. So we've talked about both the logical view of it, we've demonstrated the execution, and then we've talked about how to actually protect systems from those risks. And you probably saw some common trends in those defenses. Let's go and take a look at some of those now. One of the most important things that should have come across and it should be evident by the fact that we looked at four mitigations for every single risk, is this whole concept of defense in depth, not having single points of failure, having layer upon layer of security so that no one single thing can go wrong. A whole bunch of stuff has to go wrong in order for the attacker to be successful in their objective. SQL injection was a good example. Validating untrusted data, parameterizing queries, applying the principle of least privilege on the database permissions. All of these things contribute to defense in depth. The other thing I really hope I got across is the pragmatism that's required when looking at security. It is not just simply a case of saying something is insecure or secure. There are many shades of gray and you have to choose the right level that's appropriate for the particular application. Security can have an impact in other ways. There can be cost impacts. There can be usability impacts. And you're not always going to have the same balance on every application. They have different factors that influence what the right level of security should be. So I really want to strongly express that need for pragmatism. It's absolutely critical in building not just secure systems, but successful systems. Another theme that you would have seen come up a number of times was how these attacks can provide vectors into the internal network. So for example, with SQL injection, I explained how these attacks are actually executing in the database. The database is often behind a firewall. In many cases, that will have access to other assets within a private network segment. So even though systems may not have direct exposure, they can still be at risk from attacks that originate externally. Another good example of where we need to be cautious in the internal network was with transport layer security. So I mentioned that HTTPS is very frequently missing behind the firewall, and that is a real problem. You have to work on the assumption that the network perimeter is compromised, that there are malicious actors in that internal environment, because that is almost certainly the case. It's the unfortunate reality of running information systems today. Now there's one more thing I want to look at before we wrap up, and that's some of the other things to think about beyond what we've looked at so far in this video. Let me leave you with a few more things that you really should be thinking about above and beyond what we've covered so far. So one of them is around how actions are logged. Think about the sorts of attacks we've looked at. Things like cross-site scripting or account enumeration. Logging these sorts of activities is really, really critical because that then gives you the ability to audit the process. What exactly did happen? 
Was it successful? Did the attacker actually achieve their objective? Without logs, it's very difficult to discover that. And certainly there are many different points within the system where potentially malicious activities need to be logged. Logging of this class of behavior can be useful in all sorts of other ways as well. So for example, if there is malicious software running in the network, say something like CryptoLocker, which is attempting to access files and encrypt them such that they become unreadable. Is that kind of activity logged? And indeed, if that kind of activity is occurring, how does someone actually find out about it? That's a pretty important thing to think about. Another one to consider, and this is particularly prevalent in enterprise environments, is the practical application of access controls. And what I mean by that is to consider what sort of visibility you have into who actually has access to what. Now that may sound like a pretty fundamental thing, but particularly in environments where people get put within groups, in other groups, in other groups, in many different groups, it's very easy to lose visibility into who can actually access which resources. The traceability on those sorts of access controls are often very poor, so you really want to consider how confident you are that you can actually see who has those rights. Inevitably, when looking at things like access rights, one of the problems is people having too many of them. It's extremely common to see very excessive access rights because, hey, that makes things easy. Give the person as much as you possibly can and that is going to solve the problem of selectively granting them to just what they need. The security implications of that are obvious. It's not necessarily to say that individuals are going to access resources with malicious intent because you also have to cater for the risk that the individual's machine is compromised and malicious software is running under their identity. This actually comes back to principle of least permission again. I mentioned that in the SQL injection module. Making sure that each unit in a system, including the humans, has access to only what they need in order to perform their function. The other thing with all these permissions is who's actually reviewing it. So who's actually making sure that the right people do have access to the right resources? Now clearly that is also linked pretty closely to visibility. But one of the challenges here is that entitlements are often a factor of the business domain as well. So who in the organization actually knows what the appropriate access rights should be for each of the resources they're responsible for? That sounds like a pretty fundamental question, but often it hasn't carefully been thought through. And finally, the prioritization of security efforts. This comes back again to pragmatism. How are you going to choose the right things to focus on such that the most impactful ones are done first? And clearly some of the other bullet points here will help you determine that as well. Particularly once you have visibility into things like excessive access rights. Certainly one of the things that I'd be focusing on there is what sort of sensitive data do people have access to? What's going to have the biggest impact if that data is misused? either consciously or via a malicious actor under the victim's identity. These all just go to show that there is far more to security than what we can cover in just five top risks that are seen on the web today. It's a much more complex domain than that, and these points give you just a sense of some of the other things that you may need to be focusing on. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for viewing this video and I hope those top five risks have been useful. I'm Troy Hunt.